Not a lot. Well, as most of you heard, we went out to Shan's uh, graduation, and uh, one of the things that was unusual out there is there were a couple of midshipmen from the U.S. Naval Academy. Turns out Shan's roommate has a younger brother, a good friend of Shan and Brits, who was a midshipman there, and he brought a couple of his uh, a roommate and a friend, because they were, had a 48-hour leave, they had no other place to go, so uh, they came up here. And they just finished their second year. So I was asking them about their experience, and they said, well, it's actually been, it's the easiest year. Um, and, you know, the first year, they put you in incredible stress. They harassed you. They, you know, they make life miserable, so you learn to deal with the stress and the difficulties. The second year, you basically focus on your studies. The third year, it's your job to harass the incoming people. <laughs> you put them under all the stress. In the fourth year, you're basically, you know, looking to see, you know, where you're going to go, and you don't care about what's going on in the academy anymore. So I asked them about the experience of being harassed and, you know, was it a beneficial thing? And they said, well, yeah, you know, net thing, it actually is really good because you can handle that, you, you learn not to get stressed by other stuff, like, you know, people shooting at you and you know, other things which are kind of stressful situations. So then I asked them where they were going. And one guy said, he's going to be, to, to, he wants to go to pilot school because, uh, the pilots always get fed first. <laughs> you know, they always take really good care of the pilots, so that's what he wanted to do. The other two were going to become SEALs. Now, Navy SEALs, you know, are the guys who, uh, you know, eat raw meat for, you know, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, you know, climb mountains and do all kinds of incredible stuff. And uh, they said, yeah, about, I was talking about, I knew this 17-year-old kid who actually went and did that. He said, yeah, that's incredible, some kids do that. Um, and then they said that 70% of the academy graduates who apply for the SEAL program wash out. Now think about it, these guys have been through an incredible experience. They've learned how to deal with stress, and then they go to be trained for two years as SEALs, and 70% of them are casualties of the program. I'm thinking, how can that be? Well, I had done some research here years ago on how they trained Navy SEALs, and uh, I can understand in part, they make it a lot worse in the academy. Uh, one of the things they do is they, they have your early armor, and they make you run and swim and do all kinds of stuff, and then they make you sit under the waves as they pound on you, and you're freezing to death. <laughs> and you sit there for hours, and to develop the mental toughness to endure the difficulty and pain. The mind has to rule over the emotions. The mind has to basically say, I'm not feeling the pain. And only a certain percentage of people actually succeed in doing that. Despite, you know, think about the people get into the academy, then the people make it through the academy, people get selected for the program, they still have this large washout rate. And I thought, in a way, that's also a great parallel, because I was thinking of my sermon, to the Christian life, that there are People have all the resources that they need, they should be able to handle it, but they wash out. They're casualties of the Christian life. And so our passage deals with arming yourself mentally. I figured it's pretty appropriate to talk a little bit more about this. Um, first, I want to think about what does a casualty in the Christian life look like? It look like some of the pile of body parts, <laughs> it's not moving. No, you know, there are a few that look like that. Does it mean if someone goes off and you know, now worships Satan? Well, there may be a few that do that. But I think 70% of Christians also would probably be on the casualty list. They're, they're basically either sitting by the side of the road, no longer going up the mountain to become like Christ and serve him, or they've kind of just given up and are walking around the mountain <laughs> instead of going up it. This movement, but no progress. And in effect, they are casualties of the Christian life. They're no longer experiencing the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. And Peter wrote this whole epistle to Christians very early in the experience of the church, people who were being persecuted from the day of Pentecost. And he said, you need a certain mindset or you too will wash out. Earlier in chapter 1, he said, gird up the loins of your mind. It's a mental thing. As Yogi Berra said, 90% of it is half mental. <laughs> Yeah, you'll get kind of cat very well. Actually, went research the quote to make sure that was the accurate statement, and it is. 
Um, but the vast majority of the Christian life, and as most things, is mental. With the seals, the body can actually endure it, but the mentality makes it so they don't, they wash out. And with the Christian life, how we think about it, how we go into it, our expectations of it, the mindset we have determines how and what we do. Now, the problem is that there is so much bogus, bad, demonic information out there about the Christian life. So people are clueless and almost defenseless going into the real world with the, the Christianity. Because the Christianity is not a biblical Christianity, it's this perverted form of it. Um, I have this really bad habit of whenever I listen to anything, I put it through this biblical filter and you know, see how it <laughs> stacks up. And that's particularly true when I have to listen to speeches and other people doing sermons, which is why I'd much rather speak than listen. And <laughs> um, most of what I heard was really good. Funny thing was, most of what I heard had this little lip service paid to this idea that was, was bogus, and then the real life practical stuff was actually good. You'll understand what I mean in a minute when I highlight a bad thing I heard. Someone had to give a prayer, and they lifted a prayer from some ancient prayer book, which starts out, oh, we are such worthless creatures. And then what followed in this prayer was a bunch of biblical lies about things. And I'm thinking, yeah, if that's what you're going to be believing, you are going to be worthless. You're not going to be useful for God. You're not going to experience any of the things that God wants you to experience. You will be worthless. But Peter writes truth that we're supposed to arm ourselves with that makes us valuable and useful to God and helps us live happily ever after in the midst of any circumstances. So, top of your outline, 1 Peter 4, the first couple of verses today, I threw in the third one just for kicks because I know what's coming. But mental armor is that which distinguishes the conquerors of the Christian life from the captives of the Christian life. There are people who are taken captive to do Satan's will. They are the casualties. They are the people who are no longer doing what God wants, but wind up doing what Satan wants. And then there are people who are more than conquerors through Christ who love us in the midst of any circumstances. These are the overcomers in the book of Revelation. These are the folks who are going to hear, well done, good and faithful servant. So, both groups, the casualties and the conquerors, have the Holy Spirit, they have the Word of God. They have fellowships of believers. They have all these things. What distinguishes them one from the other? It's not like you, know, you have a certain version of the Bible and that's what does it for you. What is it that distinguishes these two? It's really the mental armor that they put on. And armor is good for two things. It protects you from pitfalls and it also helps you achieve your objectives. Our story thus far, in order to win the battle waged by temporal desires or against our soul, 2.11, Beloved, I beseech you as strangers or sojourners and aliens, abstain from fleshly desires or lust that war against your soul. If you haven't memorized that, it's probably a good one to do that. But in order to win this battle that is being waged against you by your desires, you need to arm yourself with Christ's mindset. Pretty simple. That's where the story came, that's where we came up to, and now he's going to elaborate on it. Verse 1 of chapter 4. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, command, believer, arm yourself also with the same mind. Huh. I have to do this. You have to do this. We all have to do this. Isn't that great? <laughs> when have you actually done this? And how do you do it? If you've done it, you don't need the sermon. <laughs> so, if you don't do it, I guess hopefully by the sermon you'll be able to figure out how it works. One of the ways you know that you've done this is what happens next. He who suffers in the flesh, in the temple realm, has ceased from sin. And I.B. says, has finished with sin. 99.83% of Christians, just made that statistic up, <laughs> would not say they have finished with sin. Oh, I still got a little bit more I want to try. <laughs> you know, it's like they haven't finished with it. They would not say this is their experience. But the one who suffers in the flesh, the word of God says, has finished with it, has ceased from it, is done with it. So that, verse 2, you no longer live the rest of your time here on earth in this body for the desires of men, but instead for the will of God. And then verse 3, he's gonna, I love what's happening, he says, 
Pray, you've had enough time, you've spent enough time doing what the Gentiles do, and then he goes on and lists all the stuff we'll talk about in future weeks. I love it, that you've had enough time to do that. And you should have realized it's no good. But now, you need to be doing God's will, and that's good. The key to doing God's will and experiencing it is the mental part. You need to put on this mental armor. So, let's take a look at what that entails. Roman number one, putting on the armor of the mindset of Christ. It's going to protect us from pitfalls and enable pursuit of the prize. Remember, Peter started out saying, hey, guys, there's this prize that God has in store for you. It's called your inheritance. All people who are born again can get it. However, there's going to be these difficulties that might trip you up, that will prevent you from getting it. So be on your guard, be aware, and uh, don't go the wrong way. Be holy, and you'll get them. So, the mindset. In the context of 1 Peter 4 is 1 Peter 3. It ends with a therefore in chapter 4, so you have to go back to chapter 3. And you saw, I talked a lot about suffering. Submitting and suffering, you know, wives doing it, servants doing it, you do it, the governments, yeah, it's like with each other, there's like a lot of that stuff going on. So what's this mindset that we need? Mindset of suffering in order to submit to, in obedience to God's commands. Doing that outweighs any advantage of doing my own thing. Now, I'm pretty fortunate um, from one perspective in living the Christian life is that I spent a lot of time, 20 years almost, doing the will of the Gentiles. I sinned big time, and I realized it didn't satisfy, it didn't work. So in one sense, it has a whole lot less appeal for me than particularly those of you who have been raised in a Christian environment. You think, oh, that might be good, that might be good. Been there, done that, still have the headache from it. doesn't work. <laughs> But a lot of people think, oh, well, maybe if you know, the myth of the greener grass, oh, if I did this, if I did that, trust me, it doesn't work. And anybody who's been there will say, don't go there, it doesn't work. The trouble is we don't, you know, we're Christians, so we don't talk about having been there and the fact that it doesn't work. But basically, there's nothing that will outweigh doing God's will. Nothing. And doing God's will is worth suffering for because it is so good. Peter, right up, I was going to tell us in like the next end of this chapter, he says, Beloved, don't think it's strange concerning this fiery trial, these flames, which are going to singe your eyebrows, as if some strange thing is happening to you. It's part of the Christian experience. You're swimming upstream, everything else is going downstream, you're going to suffer. That's what you sign up for when you sign up for following Christ. That's why he said right up front, Hey guys, are you going to follow me? Deny yourself? Pick up that cross that you're going to die on? And now follow me. Make up in your mind that you're going to die to the old stuff so you can follow me. If you don't do that, you won't be, be able to handle it. When he says, once you get this mindset that following God is going to involve suffering, but it's worth it, you can then be done with sin. You can leave it behind. I think God... Uh, and I've been translated pretty well when it says, You've, you're finished with it. It's like, I've been there, I'm not going to do it anymore. Now, yeah, I might go back and dabble in it, I might you know, make a mistake, I might have the wrong habit patterns, you know, there's, there's other things, I'm not gonna, we're not talking about perfection here, but we're talking about as a, a course of life that you would embrace, you're finished with missing the mark. Now you want to get on target and move with God. So, in the context of 1 Peter 3, the things that they mentioned as sin is desire for revenge, the desire for retaliation, the desire to badmouth, the desire for silent manipulation, the desire for complaining, all those things that Christ didn't do. All right? We're done with them. We don't do them. But instead, we do the right stuff. Galatians 5.24 Those who are Christ have crucified, put to death, the flesh, the desire for the temporal, with all its passions and desires that are going to trip you up. Okay, are you Christ's? Uh, I think so. I asked him to be my savior. Okay, good. Now, there's another piece. Have you crucified your flesh? Or is the thing still living? Has it been put to death and buried? Like we talked about with the whole baptism thing last time. 
Um, or are you still kind of carrying around this rotting corpse, wondering why your life doesn't smell that good? That's, if you crucify the thing, you bury it, it's gone, and you don't go dig it up. It's a term for people who go dig up dead corpses. I don't know what it is. Grave robbers, but it's another one too, but that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Paul I puts this really well in Ephesians 4.22. He says, you were taught that with regard to your former way of life, you put off that old self. You got rid of it. Which was corrupt because of the deceitful desires. You got rid of it. And then you were made new or renewed in your mindset. You developed a new set of values. And then you put on the new self which is like a good thing. So you know, if the boys came home from playing frisbee, you know, all sweaty and smelly and all that other stuff, and we said, okay guys, we're, you know, we're gonna go out for dinner, and you know, get dressed, and they go, and they still leave on their stinky smelling t-shirts, and then they put a nice clean shirt over it. They would be like most Christians, who put on their Sunday smiles, yet underneath, they stink because they haven't gotten rid of the old stuff. Now, I have two or three sermons in this series earlier about how to put away the old stuff, how to put the self to death. You should have taken some action on the basis of those and gotten rid of some of the stuff. So I'm not going to repeat it because you can go back and find it on YouTube. However, I want to go on to what we need to continue to do. A lot of people think that you let go and you let God. No. A lot of people think the battle is the Lord's, yeah, but you're his soldier, and you have to be in armor, and be in position, and do what he says, and then you can win. Isaiah 1.16, after he just highlighted your sin through the prophet Isaiah to the nation of Israel, God says, wash yourself, make yourself clean. Wow, wait a minute, he told a group of Old Testament saints to do this? Oh, they can't do that. They didn't have the Spirit of God. They had to let go and let God. No, they had to let go of their dirt and then let God tell them what to do, which was, watch yourself. Make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. And in case you don't get it, cease to do evil. Who knew stuff like that was in the Old Testament? <laughs> God's expectation is that people would clean up their act. And I, that's the theme we talk a lot about here because it's one of the things we all struggle with. So we're done with sin, we put it away, we get clean. The mindset that you need is in C. I am not here on this earth to do what gives me temporal vein, vapor-like significance or temporal vein, vapor-like worth, value, possessions, pleasure. But I'm here to do the things that give God pleasure. That's the armor we need to wear. I am here, not for myself, but for God. And the cool thing about it is if you actually adopt this mindset, you get all the stuff. It's great, but it's not your focus. When I was a wee tyke, like three to four years old, uh, my mom was going back to school. My older sister was already in school. I started the first grade at five, tender ripe right age. So three or four, she would drop me off at my grandfather's house so he could watch me. The only thing is, he would only watch the TV, baseball. And uh, so I would watch him <laughs> watching baseball. <laughs> and I noticed that whenever I, I would be visiting him, he'd have this, uh, he usually wore this t-shirt, and he had this, it's called a scapula, scapular. And if you know about these things, they're a catholic -y thing. And it's this little, like, a little bigger than a postage stamp, um, square, and it's got one that goes in the back and two little ribbons that go before it. And they put it on, and it would almost be like a, uh, it would be like a good luck charm, but it was actually a miniature form of Christian armor. And you do this little ritual where you kiss it and put it on, and it would have, you know, some saint on it or some prayer or something like that. And I was thinking, you know, I hate the whole idea of holy hardware and things you junk that you find in Christian bookstores, but they should bring these back and sell them to Protestants <laughs> with the idea that every day you need to arm yourself, put on a breastplate, front and back, with the right thinking. And if that's the thing that it takes to get you to 
start realizing you need to develop the mindset, then get one of these little things. Make one. <laughs> put some of your affirmations from toil on it. Put a couple of verses on it and pop the thing on so you remember it. Put little pointy edges on it so it digs into you during the day and reminds you that's what it's about. Or you could just dispense with the whole thing and have a quiet time and do the same thing where you adopt the mindset that you need, the Christ mindset for the day. And that's your, going to be your protection. So when Satan throws his darts of doubt and despair and discouragement and all that other crazy stuff that he throws at us, you'll get your little shield there. Ting, ting, ting. <laughs> and it would not deflect it. But the mindset, I think, is key is we are not here to do what gives us temporal power, pleasure, and possessions. We are here to please God. That is like the fundamental thing of the Christian life. When Jesus got baptized, we talked about this last week, the voice from heaven said, this is my beloved son. With him I am pleased. Well pleased. Now, one of the things I didn't touch on is, why did Jesus have to get baptized? There are lots of reasons for that. I'm not going to go into all of them here. But one of them is so we could hear that when that Jesus' purpose here on earth was to please the Father. And here he was identifying with his people and John's message. And there's a lot of other stuff going on there. But the idea is Jesus came here to please God. We as his followers need to please God. And we need to have that mindset. Speaking of his mindset, Philippians 2.15. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus who, being in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped and held on to. Some of your versions translate it robbery, which means the translators have a clue as to what the thing means. But a robber is someone who comes and grasps your stuff and takes it, and that's what Jesus is doing. He did not consider being equal with God something that he needed to hold on to. But what did he do? He let go. He emptied himself. And not only did he let go, he takes the form of a servant, and you all know Philippians too. That's the mindset we're supposed to have. That being in control of our life is being godlike, and that is something that we need to let go of. And realize that God is the one who controls lives, because he's the one who created them, maintains them, and has a great plan for them. Jesus made himself of no reputation. He didn't care about anything what man thought, we need to make ourselves the same thing. God does not do this for you. He's given you the responsibility. A lot of people say, well, I'm a big believer in the sovereignty of God. Well, so am I. A sovereign sets the rules. One of the rules is you have to do this stuff, and he's not going to do it for you. He's sovereign. We do what he says, and he says, do this stuff. Another one that I had to throw in here, one of my favorite quotes, because it's mine, <laughs> is suffering is a vaccine against short-sightedness of the soul. That's one of those things should be in that little scapular. To remind you that if you feel pain, it's a good thing. All you, know, you marathon runners, no pain, no gain. Now, you, know, you know what I'm talking about there. In the physical realm, in the spiritual realm, it's kind of similar. That the pain you feel is a good thing. When you feel that burn, it's a good thing. It means that you're being weaned, if you haven't already been weaned, from the things of this world. Or it means that you're taking some shots because you are following the world. You know, one of the things that used to amaze me is when I saw that people who wore bulletproof armor or bulletproof vest would fall over when they got shot. And I couldn't figure out what was going on there. And then I discovered that it hurts. <laughs> you know, the, the bullet doesn't penetrate or do any damage, but it hurts when you take a hit. And that's part of our experience. We should not be expected to just drift la 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 through life and everything's fine. If you're going to be following Christ, you're going to suffer like he suffered. People aren't going to be pleased. You're not going to get everything that you think you want in this earth. God will give it to you if it's best, though. Hebrews 12.3. Oh, the purpose of this life, by the way, in case you haven't figured this out, is to invest it in a beneficial future. You get one shot, one chance, one go around, that's it. And at the end of this life, you look back at, what have I got for this life? Well done, good and faithful servant, or, Bill, Bill, if you only had paid attention to me. Oh, well, okay, Lord, I'll go back and do it again. Sorry, too late. 
one, one ticket, that's all you get. Hebrews 12, 3. Consider him. Think about Jesus. Now, a lot of people, when they come across this thing, go, oh yeah, Jesus loves me. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus put a crown of thorns on Actually, someone put on him. Because he loves me. He died for me. Yeah, yeah, he did all that. That's wonderful. But there's something else to consider. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself. I don't know how Jesus would have done it or did it, putting up with all the idiots. <laughs> I mean, how could he have suffered fools wildly, but he did? How could he have taken abuse from the very people he created? And if I understand the scriptures correctly, the very people who only managed to keep their protoplasm together because Christ was holding their atoms together, and he's taking abuse from them. That's unbelievable. Consider that he did the Father's will despite, you know, probably being vexed in his spirit continually. Consider that lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Um, King James puts it as minds. I actually grabbed it without looking at um, how they moved it to the new King James. But you might want to put souls slash minds. In the Greek thinking, soul was mind, will, and emotions. If you become weary and discouraged in your thinking, in your mindset, the body will follow, and you'll wind up being a casualty. You might even become a pile of limbs sitting by the side of the road. <laughs> you can really crash and burn as opposed to just pretending you're going through the motions. So you need to put on this armor, you need to adopt the mindset of Christ that this life is not all there is. That doing God's will is going to involve a little bit of pain, and pain is not necessarily bad because my mind can control it. Think about the guys who are SEALs. They learn to control pain. Why? Because there's a special s and branch <laughs> of the military? No, because they are doing something that frequently is very, very vital, where not only their life, but our security depends on it. So they're training and training and making it so their body does what their mind tells it to do, regardless of how they feel about it. Oh goody, I get to go into Arctic water and freeze. <laughs> yeah, no, that's not what the mindset is. The mindset is, I have a job to do, I do it. And these guys can do incredible things because of that. I put a transition verse in here, Romans 12, 1 and 2, because it's going to preview what Peter says next, but if you have gone through this process of adopting Christ mindset, you'll be able to experience the wonderful will of God. Romans 12. Brothers and sisters, in view of the incredible mercies that God has extended to you, I urge you to present, to yield, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, one that's holy and pleasing to God. Don't give God stuff he doesn't want. Give him what he wants, which is you. This is how you worship in the New Testament. You don't have to bring a bloody lamb or bull or goat or something. Just bring yourself. And how do you actually offer yourself? By refusing to be conformed any longer to the thinking of this world. And instead, be metamorphosized into the image of Christ. And that happens through the renewing of your mind. If you do that, if you adopt the Christ-like mindset, then you'll be able to experience in your life God's will. That which is good, pleasing to you, and perfect. Ain't nothing better than it. Look at that. What could be better than something that's perfect? A little butterscotch or chocolate sauce on the side might be helpful. No. God's will is absolutely perfect. If it was supposed to be in there, it's supposed to be in there. Um, I've been tempted once or twice in my career as a parent to uh, murder my kids. But um, I've never done it. 
<laughs> but the thing that would actually cause me to do it is if I'm making a dinner and they come up and say, oh, I think it needs more ketchup. <laughs> Kill. <laughs> it would just be a reflex reaction. I, I would, you know, be able to plead temporary insanity. <laughs> You know, and here I am, I've been thinking of creating the, you know, this perfect blend of flavors. And this is what God has been doing from eternity past, creating this perfect will for each one of us. But we come up and says, oh, I guess it needs more root beer and ketchup. You know, it's like, ugh. You know, we ruin it. Because we put the stuff in it that we think has to be there. Which God says, no, you need to leave that out. I would maintain that most Christians do not experience God's will. Because the Apostle says, you don't experience it unless you've gone through this metamorphosis. If you have not gone through this transformation process, then you will not experience the good, acceptable, pleasing, perfect will of God. So you need to be armed so you don't get destroyed or sidetracked by Satan. And then you need, when properly armed, to know, do, and experience the benefits of the perfect will of God. So we're going to talk about the will of God for a minute. Um, you have to want it, you have to learn it, you have to choose it, you have to do it. I've had people tell me that you can't know the will of God. We're just worthless worms. We can't do His will. And it's like, dude, read your Bible. It says you can do it. Let's take a look at it. What's the will of God, first of all? I think Bill Gothard had some paraphrase like this. I didn't get to look it up, but it vaguely sticks in my mind. The will of God is the path of my life that I would gladly choose if I knew everything God knew. Think about that. God who knows everything, who knows how you're wired better than you do, who knows what's coming down the pike, has got a perfect plan for you of which there is nothing better. And if you knew everything that he knew and were morally obligated to do what was best, you'd choose his will, wouldn't you? Like God knows what's best. It's only Satan who kind of confuses that issue. So if I could see things from God's perspective, I'd say, of course I should do what God says. Like, where's the problem here? But we don't choose God's will. Why not? Because we think we know better. Because Satan has worked his way into our thinking, just like he worked his way into Eve, thinking, God's holding something back from you. And we say, yeah, you're right, bad God. And we go and mess up our lives even more. So the will of God is what I would gladly choose if I knew everything that God knew, or if I could see things from his perspective. It's not rocket science. So, first, you got to want it. You want what's good, acceptable, and perfect? Yeah. Have you ever asked God for it? Duh, gee, boss, you got to do that? Well, you don't have to, but it's probably a good idea. Look at verse uh, 8 of Psalm 143. The psalmist prays, Cause me to know the way in which I should walk. Notice he doesn't say, make me walk. He says, show me the way. For I lift up my soul to you. That's what we need to be doing in our quiet times. God, I've got these things to do today. I, I'm not really sure what the best way to go is. Show me the way, because I am basically putting my whole life at your disposal. Show me, and I'll do it. Deliver me, O Lord, from my enemies. In you, I take shelter. That's why you should do it. Teach me to do your will. Have you ever prayed that? For you are my God. Like, you own me. You made me. You created me. You sustained me. You're going to judge me in the future. So, I want to do what you want me to do. Here I am. Just show me and I'll do it. Your spirit is good. Therefore, I ask, lead me in the land of uprightness. In other words, help me walk the way that's upright. So first you have to want God's will. So you want God's will? Well, you know, I'm a perceiver, and uh, I, I want to see if there are any other options out there. 
You know, it's like, um, do you really think you're going to find something better than God's will? You really think you're going to find happiness and satisfaction and peace outside of what God has said? You really think a better option is going to come along? We're going to discover, oh yeah, look, this is something that's better than God's will. Oh, you poor people, you've been doing God's will. Oh, what losers. Here's God's will, or a better will than God's. Yeah, that's, that'll never happen. So you have to want God's will. Then you need to learn it. Otherwise, you're a fool. Yeah, that's not my words. That's the Bible. Ephesians 5.15, Paul says, Be very careful, then, how you live. Not as fools, just choosing the wrong objectives, but as wise people. Making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise or foolish, but understand, put it together in your mind, what the will of the Lord is, and then do it. A verse that I've uh, never really elaborated on in this public setting is making, yeah, actually I have in toil, sorry, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. We live in evil days. It's a jungle out there, people. And there are opportunities that God has put into our life. And uh, I was recently reading a book called Tribe by Seth Godin. And he said, Never use the word opportunity, use obligation. <laughs> we who live in this country have such great opportunities incumbent upon us also are obligations. And God, when he puts opportunities into our life, has actually given us an obligation. An obligation to be faithful with what he's put into our life. So I have to ask, God, what is your will for me to do with this? How do you want me to handle this? How do you want me to use my talents, my treasure, my time? All the stuff that you have given me that are opportunities, if I don't use them wisely, the evil days will eat them up and they'll be gone. And when I stand before the judgment seat, God will say, Bill, what about those things I gave you? Just how have you used the mind I've given you? The drive I've given you? time I've given you, the education, the relationships, the jobs. How have you used those for my glory? All of those opportunities are actually obligations that I need God's wisdom to use. And a piece of God's wisdom is, all this stuff is not for me. It's to be used for Him. Want it? Learn it. Paul prayed for the Colossians. He says, I pray for you guys, in addition to writing you this letter, that you might be filled or controlled with the knowledge of his will. So you'll do it. And to do that, you need all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You put, I put a little work into it. It's not like a quick magazine read. It's something you actually have to work on. It's something that is accessible. It's something that's attainable. It's something for which we are put on this planet. Want it, learn it, choose it. And I took, I think, a little liberties with the text, but... I agree with him, so it must be right. In John 7, 17, King James used to say, if anyone wills to do my will, he'll know. And I went a little bit further with this word. It says, if anyone chooses to do God's will. And, and they're correct, because to will is to choose. If anyone chooses to do God's will, he will find out or know whether the teaching comes from God or I'm just making it up. <coughs> This is this element where you have to choose. You might have heard this thing called free will. You got it. It's very expensive, by the way. <laughs> it causes massive damage when used incorrectly. But it is free in that you have a choice with what you do. You had a choice to be here or not be here. You went into your closet this morning. You made choices. Unless you're a guy and it's like, what's the only last clean thing that I've got? <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> you make choices, and your choices have defined you. So you need to choose. And these are some choices that are probably worth making. Second Corinthians 5.15, Jesus died for all, but those who live, I guess that would be you and me, should not, 
It also implies this obligation choice thing. Live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. Who knew? I'm not supposed to live for me. I'm supposed to live for him. Yeah, that's what it says. Ephesians 4.17, This I say, and testify in the Lord, which is like really important, you should no longer walk as the other pagans walk. The futility or vanity of their minds. That's the wrong mindset to have, their mindset. We'll talk more about their mindset next week. Because that's when Peter talks about it. But you're no longer supposed to do that. It's a choice you have to make. You should no longer. You should do something else. It doesn't happen automatically. You have to should it, which is a choice. Ephesians 5.8. You know, at one time, you were darkness. But now, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. All those are choices. None of you rolled here. Right? All of you volitionally put one foot in front of the other and came here. You make choices. You walk a certain way. It's all about choices you make. If you have the wrong mindset, you make the wrong choices. If you have the right mindset, you make the right choices. If you have the wrong mindset, you become a casualty. If you have the right mindset, you become a conqueror. Choose it. And then, I think I'm stealing this from Nike. Just do it. <laughs> Maybe Nike took it from the Bible. I don't know. Hebrews 12, 13, 21. The author says, May God make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. A couple questions I like to ask people that uh, I meet that I'm having a decent conversation with. I sometimes get through both of them, normally I just get through one. But if I hear someone's taking a Western Civ course, say, oh, that's great. What are the five factors that cause the rise or fall of civilizations? Huh? <laughs> I mean, you studied civilizations and you don't know what causes them to go up or down? And it's like, wow. There's so few people who have actually taken Western Civ courses. And I've actually asked Western Civ professors this and they can't answer it. It's like, what's the whole point? They don't know. But of Christians, a question I want to get to is, so how do you please God? And are you pleasing God? And the majority of them will say, oh no, I'm just worthless. And so few people can articulate what it is that pleases God. And if you're clueless, go to Colossians 1. Actually, there's a list of stuff that Paul said pleases God. But that's what life is about. Western Civ should be about studying what causes civilizations to go up and down, and the Christian life should be about pleasing God. He expects us to do it. Look, look what we got for it. You got the guy praying, may God make you complete, totally outfit you for every good work, so you can do his will. God provides everything you need to do it. And he works in you to do what is well-pleasing in his sight. Yet, would you say most Christians are well-pleasing to God? Most Christians would say they are not. What's wrong? They're not choosing to do God's will. It's that simple. I just repeated um, Roman, uh, Ephesians 5 8. You were once darkness, now you're light. Walk as children of light. The Spirit of God is in you to cause that to happen. And the end result of that is verse 10. You will demonstrate, show in your life what is pleasing to the Lord. So you have to want it, you have to learn it, you have to choose it, and you have to do it. Would it be a bad idea for us to pray for each other to be able to do this? The guy in Colossians 4, Epaphras, who had instructed the Colossians, who was ministering with Paul at one point, and Paul says, you know, Epaphras is always laboring fervently. Whoa, three big words there. I guess he's doing this for you in prayers. So what is Epaphras all worked up about? That he is always fervently laboring. He wants the Colossian Christians to stand perfect and complete 
in all the will of God. That should be our goal. That should be our objective. That should be our prayer for each other. That we stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Apparently, the New Testament authors and New Testament saints thought this was attainable. Otherwise, he wouldn't have spent all this time praying for it. Well, that's my problem. I don't have someone like Epaphras praying for me. <laughs> well, may God raise, pray for those, God to raise up those people if that's what you need. But, you know, Hebrews 13, 21 should be enough. God makes you complete. He makes you, gives you everything you need. You just need to do it. Um, 1 John 2.17 has a really good reminder. Kind of close out these comments. You know, this world we live in, it's passing away. It's gone. There was a speaker at commencement that I thought did an excellent job of helping the graduates realize that they live in a world that isn't going to last. He said, the careers that you're going into aren't going to last. You'll have half a dozen or more of them. He said of the top ten careers that are most sought after today, none of them existed a decade ago. And he says you're going to get into careers, don't fall into this pitfall of giving yourself to a career because your boss is going to change, your company is going to change. You have miserable bosses, you have pointy-haired bosses, you have mad bosses, you have ones who are bipolar, <laughs> schizophrenic, and uh, axe murderers. You know, you, you get... <laughs> and it all is going to pass. So it's not the thing to have, hang your hat on. I'll just give you the other two points. You said, don't hang your hat on marriage either. This guy is really big about strengthening marriages, but he says, you know, most of them don't work out. <laughs> He's got a church of 4,000 people. Big emphasis on marriage, and he says, People in this church struggle with the same issues that others do, and they're not happy. And he also said a particular appropriate comment for the current generation. I guess that's you guys. Don't give yourself to a cause, because they also don't last. So my girls drive home, Woody, the minivan, and on the back of it, so one of their friends had written, love, peace, a big heart, and then save the whales. <laughs> <laughs> and they said... <laughs> As a joke. As they're driving home, there are all these people cheering. You know, it's like they, they pull up alongside them on Route 80 and hunt their horn and go, yeah, save them. You know, it's like, come on. Yeah. <laughs> all that stuff, those causes, is going to pass away. This world and everything in it is going to pass away. And the desires of this world are going to pass away. But he or she that does the will of God abides forever. That's the stuff worth giving yourself to. You need the mindset that in doing the will of God, it's going to hurt. But it's going to be worth it. Questions? Yes, one. So then, what are the causes of the rise and fall of civilization? I have an article, so I'm going to take it. You, you, you went to one of those seven sister schools. They didn't teach any of this. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. Education's dead. Yeah, hands. <laughs> right back to the beginning of your uh, outline. Pope uh, says, He who suffers in the temporal realm has ceased from or has finished with sin. There's another similar one about women and childbirth. What does this mean? Uh, we all suffer in the temporal realm, but we're not... We all haven't finished with sin. I don't understand that. Okay. In the t this particular context, what he who suffers in the flesh, and the flesh there is the desires for things in the temporal realm. The people earlier in First Peter that he had just addressed, slaves, masters, go uh, government citizens, uh, husbands, wives, uh, fellow believers submitting to one another, in order to do those things, it, he talked about them suffering for doing the will of God. Suffering for doing what's right. So we think if we do what's right, everything will work out. So it's just smart to do what's right. But as a Christian, frequently doing what's right causes you to lose. 
And a lot of Christians are there thinking, well, I'll be a Christian because, hey, it works. You know, Proverbs is just smart, so I'll do it. But if it causes them to lose it out, then they'll maybe think, well, maybe I won't do this today. So his audience needed to be suffering for doing what's right. And when you actually suffer and are committed to suffering because of conscience towards God, knowing that God rewards you, then you're kind of done pursuing sin as your avenue of peace, pleasure, and prosperity. So that's the piece that's going on in this realm. Uh, 1 Timothy 2, passage on women and childbearing. She'll be saved through this process of raising kids. It's basically defining the two different roles of 1 Peter's audience where they lay up rewards. And basically women, he's saying, you need to do your mothering responsibilities with faith and love and patience and those other stuff. And that's where you will be saved. It's the um, stuff we talked about, the glorification aspect of salvation from last week. So that's where there is. Yeah, we all suffer because we're human. But Peter is explicitly addressing the added abuse that people incurred from those around them because they were doing God's will. And he says, the person who has suffered has done from sin. Because if I basically was embracing <coughs> sin as my good, then I would not say the things that would cause people to get mad at me. I wouldn't tell the jokes that cause them to build character. No. <laughs> so, you know, that's all why I do it. It's all about for you guys. It's just like, you know. All right, so um, that's kind of where I think where that's going. Other questions? Other questions below? Yeah, Lane. You don't mind me saying I feel like the emotional angst that you have after hanging out with most Christians is quite high. So my question number three, would I want to think about what most Christians are doing or not doing in the will of God? Um, well, part of why we do church is to equip you to have ministry in others' lives. So I want you to understand the mindset that you encounter in your friends and neighbors, and even family members, that is at odds with the scripture. So I'm going to help you be able to deal with that question. The other reason I do it is purely rhetorical in a uh, persuasive sense. Once I get someone to recognize, yeah, well, most Christians aren't doing the will of God, then it's a little bit easier for them to realize, well, hey, uh, am I doing the will of God? So you move from the general to the specific. Once you buy the general set, then you move to the specific set. It's pure manipulation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see. Well, it would seem, it is more of an observation that sometimes I think folks get excited and they go straight to doing it, but they don't know what they're doing. And so they end up in this whole process above of what's my mindset? Why am I doing this? Am I doing this to obey? Am I doing this to get significance in the nice brothers? And, yeah, they totally. Yeah, people get whipped up with the excitement, and they go out and do it, and they encounter. It's like they're taking their rifles and going out to shoot them, but they have never trained themselves. They never learned how to protect themselves while they're shooting. It backfires. They get hurt, and they'll say, "Never do that again." And Satan goes, "Yes." So that's kind of what happens. Yeah, you need the mindset. That's what the scriptures always address: the mindset. You need to understand the why behind the what. And anybody who just winds up doing the the what, the doing stuff without understanding the why stuff, eventually stops doing the what stuff. If you follow all those pronouns, you're doing good. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. Is there a certain point when you know that you've been done with sin? Like, what's that? Where's like the point? The turning point or whatever. Um. There's a lot of sins on the menu, <laughs> so you can take a few bites of them, and then you realize, I don't like that, you know. and then you can actually purpose to not go down that path again, and you're done with that one. Okay, so it's for individual. Yeah, and then Satan will come up with, hey, have you seen our specials of the day? <laughs> you don't like any of those? I got new ones for you. So, um, you know, I, I think that 
the basic appeal, if you ask you know, most of the people in this room, um, are you going to live the rest of your days here in the flesh to amass as much temporal pleasure as you possibly can before God calls you home, you would all say, nah. Yeah. So, at least I hope you would. We're going to talk more about that next week if you've had enough time to do what all the Gentiles do and you develop the thought a little more. Yeah. Related Eric. to that question, is um, being, having ceased from sin or being finished with sin, is that really value change? Uh, or is it really being kind of perfect and don't sin anymore? Yeah, it's a value change. It's you, you, you no longer are embracing sin as your highest good. You're now embracing the will of God as your highest good. So we're not talking about perfection, but we're talking about being a whole lot better than we used to be. As most of our lives will testify, you know, just think about what you were like before you knew Christ, then after you knew Christ, and then once you started growing in Christ. And there are very distinct changes in doing that last phase. Yeah, John. Is there uh, <coughs> one specific value that is more pervasive than others that would cause you to be more mindful of, of sin and therefore change in more areas? I think the value that would be most helpful for helping a person be mindful of sin is this idea that I talked about of pleasing God. Does this please God? When I am getting homicidal feelings towards someone who's annoying me, I think, <laughs> oh, please God. Yeah, he would really love it if this person was no longer on the planet. <coughs> nah, I guess not. <laughs> oh, from the Old Testament times. <laughs> we'll wipe them off the face of the earth. Oh, I love them. Oh, do good to those who persecute you and say evil things against you. Oh, man, that, that actually hurts. Being nice to people who are evil, who are hurting you. Yeah, that's what we're called to. That's what Jesus did, yeah. So that value of, does that please God? If we, the problem is most people do not know what pleases God. They do not have a biblical example. They don't understand that wiping out evil actually does please God in certain circumstances. So, you know, pleasing God is something we need to be at. Am I pleasing God? Am I doing what is pleasing in his sight? Because that's what he wants. So that's a key value. Yeah, great. I'm um, kind of related to question four. What kind of suffering exactly are we looking for? Like, for example, if I'm like, oh, I have this suffering, I just vacuum behind my face, death, and I'm about to play a frisbee on that. That's really not suffering, but it's denying my back. So how is suffering? Work? Suffering, all right, most people think of suffering as like that persecution stuff. Right. But there's also the, the little stuff, because we don't get to live with persecution every day, at least not in our country. But actually it is those little things where you are choosing not my will, but the Father's will, repeatedly. It's self-denial causes a little suffering. Now, once you've gotten through the process of, okay, I'm dead, I'm buried, and I don't do that anymore, or I don't think that way anymore, I'm done with that, it doesn't really feel like suffering. You know, like eating a Twinkie? Well, <laughs> I'm actually... Who wants that high fructose corn syrup and all those preservatives and all that other stuff? You know, it's just like, it's not suffering to refrain from eating a Twinkie. Now, if we're talking about some chocolate, it's another story. <laughs> but, you know, it's like, you do, you've done the value change. I hate to use the green peppers in me illustration again, but, you know, it's like, it, it's not a suffering. <laughs> okay, you hearing me talk about not liking green peppers, that's suffering. Embrace it, it's good for you. <laughs> Yeah, you I would take these verses, I would go to the online Bible, I would uh, type into the search bar or even just Bible Gateway, the will of God, I would print out the list of verses, I would email it to them. I would carry it on a piece of paper and give it to them, and eventually they'll stop talking to you. <laughs> and the problem's solved. <laughs> the Word of God is so clear. I mean, look at the verses. It's like, God's working at it. God, God works, if, oh, you know, if I wanted to be a little nasty, which, of course, I'm done with that. Um, but Philippians 2, <laughs> hey, no laughing back there. <laughs> Wait a minute, they all live in my house. <laughs> Philippians 2, 14 says, 
13, 14. God's at work in you to will and to do his good pleasure. So that means that, wait a minute, you can't know this stuff? You can't do it? He's not at work in you? Well, what happened? What, what's gone wrong? That's his thing. You're supposed to do his will. So, you know, I, there are people, I hate to say this, but by and large, for a person to have embraced a lie that big and that significant, there are hoof prints circling them. So be, beware. Yeah, the, the verse, uh, Colossians 1 9, it says, um, Do not cease to pray for you and to ask that, that you may be filled yeah. with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom. <laughs> First, it's in black and white. First Thessalonians 4, verse 3, for this is the will of God in your sanctification. Oh, yeah, but you can't know that. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is made up. <laughs> even, even with those here, verse, uh, Romans 12, 1, you know, we're doing all those things, reading our minds, and we can actually do the will of God. Yeah, apparently their verse, their Bibles don't have those verses in it. You know, they got it from probably some other Bible society than the good one. Okay, let's uh, close in prayer. Thank you, Father, that you love us and care for us. Have plans for us that are for our good. Thank you that it is your desire that we experience them. I pray that you would guide us into obeying you and doing the things that you have set before us so that we might experience your good pleasure in our lives. Father, we think of all that you have done for us. You have always been loving us, desiring what's best for us. You have always done what's right. You have always give, even given yourself for our highest good. So Lord, we know that we can trust you, embracing fully whatever you might have down the road. And Lord, we know that if it involves suffering, it's because you're protecting us and training us for something far, far better. I uh, pray that we would embrace this truth, be like Christ, be pleasing to you. And I pray that we would also be mindful of the need that each of us has for others to pray for us, that we might be stand perfect and complete in all of your great good will. We ask these things and thank you for our food in Christ's name. Amen.